welcome. Thank you for doing the interview, and um, hope you're enjoying Pinball Expo here. So, first question has to be, uh, why why do you choose Pirates of all the titles and all the assets that are out there right now? Why 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 is Pirates the right title for now? So uh, we have to roll back the clock a little bit. Everybody knows there was a Pirates game done in 2006 by Dennis Nordman. And uh, I love the game, I love the movie, and uh, PinballSales.com sold hundreds of those games. And we had a lot of fun with it. We, we did the promotions on Talk Like a Pirate Day, uh, you know, all kinds of crazy things. People would call up talking like a pirate, and, and, and it was a lot of fun. But I noticed that um, the appeal for the game was universal. It was from men, children, women especially. And um, there was a day, you know, it was before, you know, Facebook thing and, and all that kind of stuff, where I put a picture of Dennis and I with the game on the website on July 14th, 2006, on the Pinball Sales website. We sold 100 games in one day. And that told me that that's an amazing title. And, and um, I thought it was time to do it Jersey Jack way now. Okay, so um, Eric, this is obviously your, your first design, mm -hmm. game, not your first title you worked on for, for, right. for Jack, but uh, your first own game. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about your background in, in pinball and in the company as well. Sure. Um, when I was very young, my father started a route operation in the Wisconsin Dells. Um, we had 100 arcades. Started it, and the next year started it with one arcade, and the next year he had over a hundred. Um, my father does not do anything halfway, so mm -hmm. he got full into the gaming business. Um, and I never had a babysitter as a kid. I was always with my parents. They owned their own business. They always took their kids with. So I picked up um, the arcade game lifestyle pretty quickly. Um, from around the age of seven. I was repairing electronics, um, learning how to solder, learning how to use a voltmeter and, and make games work again. And then probably from the age of 12 until I went to college, every night, every weekend and every summer, I was being paid as an employee of Kingpin Games to work and repair games and collect coins and you know go and fix stuff in our realm. Um, after high school, I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison and earned a degree in electrical engineering and then a master's degree in mechanical engineering. And I had no plan on getting back into um, coin-op. I was not at all interested. I grew up working with my father and it was a very hard thing to do and I had no interest in getting back into it. But to have some fun with my dad and my brother, we went to the Midwest Gaming Classic in 2012 where Jack was talking about his new company, Jersey Jack Pinball, and this new pinball he's coming out with, Wizard of Oz, and how he was looking for some good people to start a brand new company and bring a brand new game online and bring pinball back. And I thought about it for a while, and I sent my resume out to him, and Jack himself called me back and said, I really want you to come in, and we can, we can sit down and chat and see what we can do together. And I was brought on while I was still in my master's program. I was driving down to Harvard, Illinois for three days a week. I was teaching a class at, up in school while I was finishing my master's thesis and still taking courses, so it was a very hectic time. Um, the first week of the job, I walked into a room full of parts, and I was told, build a Wizard of Oz pinball machine. <laughs> oh, okay, do we have drawings? No. You can figure it out. Okay, so that's what I did. And from there, I earned the position of electrical engineer in the company. And I have designed all the electronics in Wizard of Oz, hot it and dialed in. And for game number four, um, there was a meeting in the company to try to figure out what we wanted to do, who should be the next designer. Should we try to get someone, an industry veteran, to come in and design the next game? And after a lot of internal discussions, I put my name in the hat and said, I know pinball, I know this industry, I've been around it for 20 plus years, even though I'm only 28 years old. And 
people have faith in me that I could do it. I worked with a good team. I mean, people on my team, Keith Johnson, you know, knows pinball better than anyone. And he's a lead programmer and he knows what makes shots fun, what makes games fun. And I was given a shot to, to make a game. So Jack, why was that? Why, why did you pick Eric? Well, I was going to say, it wasn't that a huge well, risk. There's another guy in the room, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Who's this guy? I thought that was Gary Flower. Oh. No. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, so you're taking a Jim chance. Jim Shelberg. No, it's not him either. No. It's Jonathan Justin. How are you, Jonathan? Yes, indeed, Jonathan. Good to see you. Likewise. Yes. So, so getting back to appointing Eric as a designer for Pirates. I assume the theme was already picked by them. Yeah. So, uh, was there a risk, or obviously there was some faith or confidence that he could do it, but you took a chance, or so to speak. So I think in the first, I think in the first um, meeting I had with Eric, in my mind, I knew he could design a game. I, I, I might have even said that to you in the very, very, very beginning. And, I, and you know, uh, uh, people think I'm crazy sometimes when I say something like that because it sounds so, you know, outlandish, kind of wild thing to say. But, you know, here he is, grows up in a, in a game family, great player, understands what makes games work and service them. You know, you being a technician and operator, that's really important to me because we want games on location that work so they can make money, right? And then you have, um, you know, a guy that knows robotics, has a degree, electrical engineering, has a degree, and the practical knowledge that I know that he'll have to learn on top of everything he knows. This is like in baseball, they call like a five-tool player that can do many things. Mm -hmm. And that's what you need. You don't need just, in a little tiny startup, you can't really have somebody that's a specialist only in one thing. Everybody's got to do everything, pretty much, because you can't have all those people um, doing those jobs. So, um, you know, your question is about risk, and it's about, um, you know, taking a chance. You know, I believe you get out of bed in the morning and you take a risk and you take a chance. So starting a pinball company was a risk, taking a chance, doing unlicensed games, doing different things. You calculate that, you know, people, entrepreneurial thinkers are dangerous because they have to convince themselves first of something. They have to sell themselves on the idea, even though it might sound so crazy. If I don't believe in it, I can't sell him on it. So if he's coming into the company, he's starting a life. You know, there's a big responsibility in that, not just for him, but other people that are hired in the company too in the very beginning. So, you know, I took a leap of faith on him, but he took that leap of faith on me too, because, you know, I hired him right before he graduated, because I wanted him. I said, you know what, um, and, and, and actually he got interviewed by other people in the company that didn't respond to you. And you sent me an email and said, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was interviewed by these people and nobody got back to me, you know, what's going on. I was kind of upset about that and, you know, I just hired him. I said, you have a job, you start, you know, as soon as you can. And I said, you know, if I'm going to wait for him to graduate, I'm going to lose him. I'm going to lose him. I better get him while he has an interest in doing this thing and, and, and bring him into the company. And I am, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that I did. I. I I never saw it as a risk on Eric. I never saw it as a risk. Um, I saw somebody that had a passion and a love, uh, truly, to make something great. You know, so I was real happy with that. And and you know, we'll get into it a little bit more. Al, but last night, you know, was it was probably as much a dream for me to see that happen that way as it was for him. It really was. Okay, so you've, you've got the title, you've got the job. Where do you start? Okay. You've got Pirates of the Caribbean, a huge title, it's got a responsibility. Of it's, 
<laughs> it's a big, it's a big title, yes. and and um, everybody's going to be very excited about it. So, where do you start with the design process? Do you have a bunch of ideas in your mind already about what you want to do with it, or do you just do you do a brainstorming? You tell us something. Mean, how how did that game come into existence? Um, when we started, the fifth movie wasn't out yet. It was barely announced by Disney, um, so there was no film to research, there was nothing to look at. Uh, I wound up getting a self-destructing script from Disney, uh -huh. emailed it to me, and destroyed itself within 72 hours. So I had to take some good notes on what the fifth movie was all about, and try to figure out how to incorporate that into the game. Um, what I really wanted to do in the design, so there's a couple different fields of thought on how to design a game. Um, what's the most important thing. And I believe that the toys that affect the ball are the most important. Those should come first, they should take up all the space they need, and then your shots fit around them. You make the shots work around the toys. Um, after watching the movies extensively, I mean, I did, I probably watched each movie four or five times, took notes of all the characters, all the scenes, all the different items of interest, like the compass, and the map, and ship in the bottle and all this other stuff that is iconic. You recognize the different parts of the movies and I had a whiteboard with probably ten different columns of different you know, characters and places and ship names and all of the different um, unique items that have magical properties and things like that. Put them all up on the board and try to figure out what I could do with them. And a lot of the items really lent themselves to, to pinball. So, I consider myself a, a, a good player. Um, something I really like in pinball is, is having split focus. So if you have multiple balls going, multiple balls in multiple play fields, I find that very enjoyable, very challenging, right? You cradle a ball in the lower play field and continue to play with a dual-staged flipper on the upper play field. So I really wanted an upper play field in my game, and I wanted to do something that never been done in a commercial game before. So a rocking play field that has flippers on it. Um, a good friend of mine, Jay, turned a game into a flash. He put it into a wide body game and he hooked up a big ice cream machine motor to the whole game so the whole play field did what my mini play field did. So I want to recognize that inspiration for this definitely came from, from Banger Jay. Um, so I took that play field and just knew that it had to be the Black Pearl. And we had to have the Black Pearl out in the water and it had to rock. And it's, a, it's really interesting. It really messes with the ball in a way that I haven't seen before, I haven't played before. And people really get a big smile on their face when they, when they play that for the first time. Um, I tried to split the focus on the game between all five movies evenly. So I wanted to have a major shot, a major device from each movie integrated into the game. So the Black Pearl, um, the, the big map, in the middle, which is a very intricate device that's that's pretty cool. Um, we'll come to that a little yeah. bit later. Yep. You know, um, the big chest, you know, the, the, just the different iconic pieces of the movie that you that I focused on. I grabbed and I put in the game, and then I figured out how to make the shots work. And personally, I I saw the first two games that Jersey Jack made, the wide body games, and that felt like really good new pinball, jam-packed full of toys, and I knew that my game had to be a wide body. It had to be. This is what started Jersey Jack. We had a full, feature-rich pinball machine, and I wanted to, to do that again. So, wide body game, full of toys, with everything I could think of that was from Pirates. Were there any restrictions in what you could do with the game because this is a, um, a very popular license and the licensor usually is like on top of what are you going to do and they don't want their license to look bad right. so that did you have to consider the things or absolutely I mean there wasn't a 48-hour period that went by where I wasn't in contact with Disney. Um, you know, discussing not pinball-related things because they don't 
understand or care about the pin mill related stuff, but how their assets are being used. Um, every piece of art in the game has been hand painted, so we took their assets from their style guides and repainted them so that they have that nice, fresh, hand done look. And all of those things had to be submitted back to the original talent, not just to Disney, but Johnny Depp and Kieran Knightley and Kevin McNally all had to sign off on the artwork that we did. We have 22 characters, 22 actors and actresses had to sign off on our play field in order for us to be able to move forward with it. And then all of the different artifacts that we use, like the chest and the, and the ship and the, the rock on the uh, Devil's Triangle, all of that stuff had to be signed off by the creative team at Disney. So at one point there were 14 different people at Disney that I was talking to through different departments, from the, from the studio team, to the design team, to the creative team, to the legal department, to the audio department. I mean, we just went... I know a lot of people at Disney now. <laughs> um, there were a lot of things we couldn't do, but we focused on the things we could do and jammed as much of the title as we were allowed into this license, into the game. So you, you got a good number of assets from Disney for Absolutely. this? Absolutely, yep. In terms of... Um, imagery and not no voices is that true from the movie that's correct but we were able to get kevin mcnally mm -hmm. um, in a studio and he recorded over 1100 lines for us for the game which was a surreal experience mm -hmm. in my opinion and who wrote those lines i wrote those lines mm -hmm. so i went through the movies and found every line that gibbs spoke and decided if it could be used in a pinball machine and there's a lot of stuff in can be used and then went through after that and wrote a script of pinball specific things and got that cleared with Disney and it's like I want to make sure we can say the word jackpot because technically jackpot wasn't a word that was invented until the mid 1800s and this movie takes place in the mid 1700s so there was actually pushback on specific words for, for pinball that like well technically that's not part of the timeline and I don't know if we should do that guys it's a pinball machine you want your license to look good in a pinball environment, he needs to say jackpot. He needs to say multi-ball. He needs to say these things. And they gave in, and they let us record every line we wanted to, um, every speech call-out that I asked for. Mr. McNally recorded several takes of each one of them and you know, asked for my feedback. And again, this was it's unreal to have this very famous actor who took time out of... He's performing right now. He's performing King Lear at the Shakespeare Globe in London. And he had a day off, and he came into the studio and sat down for two and a half hours and recorded all of this speech for us and asked me my feedback and re-recorded some lines that I asked for, and it was very, very cool. Do you have a, a live feed with the studio that you could see what he was doing? Yes. Yep. Yep. So a direct line, and him and I were talking back and forth, and it was very cool. Okay. Um... How much of the voice calls and so on are currently in the game? Because we played the game here, right? It's debut at Expo, mm -hmm. um, but it won't be available until like February, March. That gives you guys a lot of more time to right. develop right. software for it. So, how far would you say, code-wise, if that's the proper term, mm -hmm. the game would be along right now? Um, talking to Keith. Earlier, he says the code is at about 20%. Um, it seems like it's a lot further along to me. The game already has four of the movie's multi balls in it. It has 105 unique chapters that you can play through. It has the Tortuga multi ball. It has the pirate lane rules. It has a mystery system built in. It has the all the drivers for all the mechs, the spinning map. I mean, it to me it seems like it's a lot further along than 20%. But Keith. The rule master says it's at about 20%. And so everyone knows the Jersey Jack policy is we do not ship games with incomplete code. So Pirates will have rule complete code when it ships. Every insert will, will function and serve a purpose. All modes will be available, wizard modes, mini wizard modes, multi balls, everything will be in the game. Now it's not to say we won't send out updates later to do mm -hmm. polishing and and scoring, balancing, and things like that, but everything will be achieved in the game. 
Okay, so you're the lead designer. Keith is doing the software. Is I mean, who else is working on the game? You know, who's doing the art? Who's doing the music? Who's I mean, it's Keith. Um, Keith's probably not the only one working on the software. Correct. So, uh, so, so who is involved? Is it obviously a team effort and a big, yes. um, no, reasonably large team at that? Very much so. Yeah. Um, so, in the software department, Keith is the head programmer, and then two other programmers who came on board during Dialed In are focused on the game. So, Joe Katz, he's a very good tournament player, mm. um, very well ranked, very good player. Um, really good at understanding programming and pinball rules. Um, he's come up with a lot of cool, unique features in the game um, from a code perspective. And then another programmer, JT Harkey, came on board and he's really good at the Linux interface and the heavy lifting and getting some really cool stuff, back-end stuff into the game. Like he developed a, a protocol to create all these 105 different chapters that have all these different characters and all these different titles and sound calls and and light shows and, and all this stuff and he whipped up a program that anytime he wants to change something it, it'll go through automatically and update all 105 of these at once and you know it's the, the thousands and thousands of lines of code and just spit out this code writing code in in a weekend and saved himself hundreds of hours in the mechanical engineering department, Dan Malter and Yolanda Wissington are the two mechanical engineers with support from Wally Welch. Um, Dan has really knocked the mechanical devices out of the park. I mean, it is unbelievable to see what he did. You know, I came to him with this idea of, hey, I want to have a spinning disc in the game, but I want it to actually be three spinning discs one within the next, within the next, and I want them to go counterclockwise and clockwise at variable speeds, and I want them to stop on a dime because they're gonna line up and spell out awards for the player, and they can't be turned from the center, they have to actually be turned from the, because, mm. you know, they're kind of mm. hollow. So he, he, we spent a couple weeks sketching things out and coming up with designs, and um, I hand, fabricated the first couple sets and we put them together and we found out what worked and what didn't work and refabricated a couple more and the other device that I mean, is, is awesome and a testament to how good of an engineer he is is, is the other playfield mm. that rocks. I mean, literally rocks, <laughs> also rocks. <laughs> um, it, it's very elegant, it's very simple in its design but so functional and the best part Thing that I was adamant about is growing up as an operator I know what it was like to work on games in a dark bar at 10 o'clock at night when you only have a Phillips screwdriver and nothing else games need to be easy to work on and so this upper play field you remove one screw from the pivot point and you pull a cotter pin or a, a hairpin that disconnects the motor and the whole play field slides back and slides out of the game you don't have to lose a bunch of parts and, and bust your knuckles up and try to figure out how to undo the play field. It's very simple to take out. Same with the spinning disc. It's very simple to take out. The whole thing is level with four wing nuts. So you can level it in the play field and you undo those four wing nuts and the whole thing slides out and comes out of the game and it needs to be serviced. It's just a very impressive. I, I'm very impressed with how well he did designing these mechs. Um, the art department, there are a couple artists, Sean Paul DeWin is doing all the animations, um, doing a great job, he hand drew that map that's on the back glass, the treasure map that shows progress for all the multi-balls, and that thing just looks great, Disney approved it right away, they loved it, thought it looked, looked awesome, really fit the license. The 3D art uh, was sculpted by Matt Reeser and Dave Link, they both had different projects that came together, um, and those turned out phenomenal. I mean, they really captured the essence of the Black Pearl and the Dauntless and you know, the, the pirates that are having a party in Tortuga. You know, that's just an awesome feat how, how well those sculpts came, came together. Uh, the 2D art, it was done by a new artist to pinball. His name is Jay Zielinski. Um, he really did a great job. I mean, all of the art looks phenomenal, and the fact that these very highly paid and the high egoed actors 
signed off on all of his hand drawings of, of their faces. This is a testament to how, how good he did. The art blends very well. It looks like a big piece of art instead of a whole bunch of clip art pasted together onto a play field and then, and then shipped out. So the standard edition, limited edition art package looks phenomenal. And the collector edition art package really came together and just, just blows it away. Um, Sound-wise, music? Sound-wise, David Thiel, mm -hmm. once again at the helm. Um, he was at the helm for the original Pirates game and reprised his role as lead audio engineer again. And he is he's doing a great job. I mean, we got... He was also on the call with Kevin McNally and helped direct the, the audio call-outs and has come up with a whole bunch of you know, unique pirate sounds, bottles breaking and people roughhousing in a bar and... You know, splashing water and birds and sharks and all that stuff. So, doing a really good job. Um, yeah, nothing for the moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, do, do you want to tell? I mean, you mentioned about the different versions of the game. Do you want to tell us what the differences are between the uh, the standard edition, the the limited edition, the collector's edition? Sure. The um, difference between the limited and the standard. Um, is pretty typical in what we offer at Jersey Jack. So the limited um, over the standard includes a shaped motor and invisible pass, a couple of sculpted toys, and a light board on the back of the game uh, called the Starfield. Yes. So they are all purely aesthetics. Um, the, there's powder coated armor, and I think that's it. There's, the spinning pop bumper guys aren't included in the standard edition. And the, the Devil's Triad on the left hand side isn't included in the standard edition. The standard edition comes with white general illumination instead of the RGB general illumination that comes in the standard collector edition. So, all aesthetic changes mm -hmm. at Jersey Jack, we do not remove parts from the game in order to make it a different game. No, and, and um, I mean, how far are you at, along with the uh, collector edition as to what you want, exactly what you're going to do with that? Obviously, you've shown us. Topper, which looks yep. like an impressive device, okay. um, and you've shown us some, some cabinet yes. um, barnacles and things yep. like that on the side rails, a different treatment to that. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that. Is that completely um, worked out now, what you're going to do with that, or is that still under development? The, it's still in development. The, the proof of concept is there. Mm -hmm. I really like how the lockdown bar looks, I really like how the hinges look with the starfish barnacles on them. Um, we plan on adding some more barnacles, slightly. <coughs> Sorry, I've been talking for three days already. Okay. Um, the reason I didn't put the side armor on the game that I have out there, I showed it as a proof of concept. I'm probably going to change the shape and size of the barnacles that are on there. Um, but that gives people an idea of what it will look like. We are going to use that powder coat color. We are going to use that art package that's been signed off on tentatively by Disney. Um, so they're going to go through the fine tooth comb to make sure yeah. it's everything they want. But the back glass cabinet art and armor color and the concept of the barnacles are what we're going to do. And then topper as well. Right. And the collector's edition has a different art package on the playfield as well? It does, yes. So there is a trend in pinball where people seem to focus on the bad guy. We really had good success with our, with our Smog edition of The Hobbit. And so the Davy Jones edition collector's version of the game um, really strikes a chord with a lot of people, and they, they like the you know, tentacle menace that is Davy Jones, and with him staring at you right there in the middle of the playfield, surrounded by his awesome pipe organ that's in the bottom of the Dutchman. Um, I just love that art, and Jay Z did a great job bringing that into the playfield and, and making it look really good. So, as a, a new player, they walk up to the game, they press, they put the money in it, first of all, of course. Um, and press the start button, what happens? What do they do? What do they do? Well, what are they aiming for? What, what? Well, the game starts, there are uh, three skill shots available. You can short plunge into the pop bumpers. You can do a medium plunge into, there's a, a hole underneath Black Pearl Playfield. It falls and actually the ball rolls uphill to the back of the game, shoots up on top of Pearl. 
Mm. The third skill shot is you do a full plunge, it comes around, there's an upper flipper, and you can plunge the ball into, or shoot the ball into the uh, captain's quarters. However, if you are very skillful, you can multiply your skill shot value by shooting the inner orbit several times, then shooting it into the captain's quarters to give a huge multiplier to your skill shot. So very skillful skill shots. And the objectives are what? To, the to start all the, to the collect characters? Is, to the game is primarily focused on, um, there are sets of rules for each movie. Mm -hmm. So the game has 105 different chapters that you could potentially play through. However, that number is a little overwhelming to people. So we've decided that each movie, there's about 20 of them per, per movie, we're going to select five at random from each movie. So you'll have a set of 25 chapters to play through. Which means, since they are randomly selected, mm -hmm. we have an astronomical number mm -hmm. of combinations of, of game rules. So I can say with statistical certainty that no one will ever play the same game with pirates twice. It's statistically impossible to ever play the same game again. And those those modes are randomly selected, uh, not, not player selected. Anyway. Correct. Um, so, speaking of player selection, the first thing that happens is you select your captain um, that you play as. There are twenty-two characters on the playfield. We decided to make each of them a playable character. They each have different abilities and different powers that relate to those characters in the movie. For example. Captain Salazar is the, is the villain from the fifth movie. He always leaves one man alive. Mm. So his ability is if you multi-drain out of a multi-ball, if you have multi-ball going and you drain all of your balls down to zero, one ball will come back because Captain Salazar always leaves <laughs> one man to tell the tale. Mm. Um, other, other captains um, making, making chapters easier, making for it. For example, Angelica, she always spots one male character that you need to collect because she's a very beautiful woman. <laughs> that works really well. Um, so these 22 different captains all have their own unique abilities. And as a player, you need to build your strategy. You need to have several strategies because in this game, you cannot choose the same captain as anyone else. So in a four-player game, you have to have four different strategies based on what your opponents are choosing. Is that also the case in tournament mode? Yes. We want that to be the case in tournament mode. We get Keith and Joe Katz are very good tournament players and they will make it balanced so that it's not there isn't a distinct unfair advantage in anyone. The whole point is that there can be multiple viable strategies mm -hmm. and not just one selection that everyone picks because they know that's the best. That's not what we want to do. So then my question would be, if you have a novice player that might have seen a few of the movies mm -hmm. but not seen them like four or five times and know them from the back to the front, um, will they be able to understand the game yes. as a novice player? I mean, The game is first and foremost pinball. So it explains, we have the shots lit up to tell people what's going on. There are five shots in the game that are indicative of the five different movies. They have the movie um, logo on those five different shots. There's a unique skull and crossbones for each of the movies. Um, and they're color coordinated to, to match. So like movie one is this gold color. Movie two is like a green and then a red for movie three, a blue for movie four, and this ghostly purple for movie five. We try to make the colors match the different stuff from the movies. So if you shoot into those movie shots, you're lighting up the chapters for those movies, and you can you can start those different chapters in a, in a shot in the center. How about the monitor on the Ah, yes. Apron. That really helps the novice player. So <coughs> down between your flippers in the apron, there is a 4.3 inch LCD screen. And on that screen is Captain Jack Sparrow's magical compass. And from the movies, that compass always points at your heart's desire. And in pinball terms, that means that's where you're supposed to shoot. This is where the points are, this is how your multi-ball gets started, or 
your extra ball is over here. So that compass literally points at the best shot in the play, in the play field. So if myself or Keith or Joe or JT were standing behind you telling you what to shoot, that's what this compass is going to do. Okay, what about the, um, the map? Because the map is obviously a major part of the, yes. of the game and the uh, impacts on the play. Spinning the spinning map. map. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the spinning map has three different rings, um, variable speed and multi-directional for each of them. It, it, when you hit the map targets up near the top of the game from the upper left flipper, the rings turn on, so they can be on independently or all together, and all moving in one direction or all in different directions. It really adds some fun spin to the ball, um, but it doesn't do it in a completely unpredictable manner. You can see the ball as it's spinning, you can see what's going to happen. It's not a magnet right there that's going to whip it without you having any idea where it's going to go. So I like the idea of being able to see how the ball is going to be affected. Now, you can't necessarily react fast enough. Um, but you can at least see what's going to happen. And when the map, so you've hit those three targets and then there's a shot right next to that called the captain's quarters. If you shoot the ball into the captain's quarters, the map will stop. And there are words written on the map. As those words line up, they spell out different awards for the player. Um, there are over 200 viable combinations from the word combinations that we have and things like light extra ball or award 10 times 25,000 points or plunder opponent's ball is a good one that I can't wait to use. <laughs> Sounds interesting. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of good combinations in there and that code is being fleshed out and it's, it's already proven to be a lot of fun. Was that feature difficult to get approved? Because it's obviously inspired on, I think it was the third movie where the mm -hmm. map was used. Um, but that map in the movie has a sort of different function. Now you're using words on it to put an award together, right. which is, so that could have been an obstacle for Disney. Yes, so Disney didn't seem to have a problem with anything that wasn't talent based the objects, like the chest, for example, of Davy Jones, um, the, f the real chest from the movie is very much taller than what we have in the game. Mm -hmm. Our game is a lot longer because we needed it to be longer because that's a f the size of a three ball lock. Mm -hmm. It needed to be a little bit longer and narrower. Right. And I sent them the sculpt, just turned around in a day. Absolutely no problem. Please proceed. Um, same with the Black Pearl. You know, it was... It was slightly different geometry, but when I explained we need to modify the back of the ship so that you can see the flippers. You know, if we had the Black Pearl with this big, ornate wood sculpture in the back, you'd be looking at this and you have no idea where your ball is as you're trying to play on there. Plus, I have a ramp that goes up to the center of that. So, they seemed fine with the non-talent based modifications to, to their assets. And the, the map is the same story. So Jack, how does how does Pirates of the Caribbean fit into your your product line now? Because this is your fourth game. Do you, what's the development? How has how has the game moved on and developed from your very first Wizard of Oz up to game number four? You know, seeing them all together, um, I use an analogy. Uh, you could tell they're all in the same family, but I don't think one's really better than another. They really all complement each other. And our customers, um, they're pretty much buying all of them because they really fit very well together. Uh, very different gameplay for each game. Um, no rehashing of things between games. Uh, no recycling of, uh, of mechanisms, nothing like that. And uh, it seems that the feeling um, by everybody I heard, you know, in the last two days is, you know, it's just amazing how you can continue to innovate and, um, and bring more to the game. So this game fits in really well because we're still building Wizard of Oz, we're still building Hobbit, we're building Dial In, and 
you know, in a very short period of time, uh, we'll be building pirates. And um, it's really cool for our distributor to say to a customer, oh, you're setting up a new arcade. Well, take the pirates, take a dial in, take a Wizard of Oz, take a Hobbit, and have four games. You know, for a long time, we went to a lot of shows, and the flavor was Wizard of Oz or Wizard of Oz. Um, and you know, now you look back and it's uh, only a short six years later. Um, it seems like dog years, about you know, 100 years later, we know as we've you know, grown in everything we've learned and as a company. But um, it's, it's, it's just great. I mean, uh, I'm very proud of the game, I'm very proud of everybody that had you know, everything to do with it, all the passion, all the work, and um, the response has been you know, nothing short of amazing. I mean, you know, we've been inundated with orders today. And, and yesterday, and uh, I can't say when any kind of company reveals a product, you know, the reaction of the audience is, uh, you want them to love it, you want them to say, wow, and, and, and respond positively and buy it. I mean, we're, we're committed, uh, you know, the same commitment today is the commitment way back. It's uh, make great games, take really great, care of the customer base and um, you know treat everybody as you want to be treated and support what you do make make games that make money on location that work people love these games they're going to keep them forever we'll be long gone and uh, the, these games will be there I, I know that um, I just I just see all the passion from the customer base whether they're operators or you know the home customers all over the world it's just really cool to make a product that makes people happy and to see people smiling and, and happy in today's world um, to be able to build pinball machines it's just it's just a, a real gift and uh, yeah, thankful for it every day it's just amazing so it makes me wonder Eric this is your first game it's a very impressive game um, so yesterday was the big review once the game, so how were you feeling prior to the review? Obviously, you knew what you had done, but it's always you have to see how the people respond. Mm -hmm. And following that, okay, it's been like 24 hours since the game got revealed. How have those been for you? I was very much looking forward to the reveal. Um, I'm not at all nervous in front of crowds. I've been working on this game for a year. I have so many friends that are in the pinball world who I haven't been able to share this with. And last night was my opportunity to share it with not only all of my close friends, but the whole pinball world at large. And I was just so excited last night to finally be able to show people what we've come up with. And people loved it. You know, I've Pinball people are not shy or bashful when telling you they don't like something. And I haven't had a single person come up and say anything even remotely negative to me about the game. It's been pretty surreal. Um, I got home at 2.30 this morning and was probably woken up by my two-year-old at 5 who came in to come and play with Daddy and got back to the show at around 7. And um, it's been nothing but, but good response and great people to hang out with. and. Everyone really seems to like it. Right, well, thank you very much, Jack and Eric, for taking time out. Well, that was obviously a very busy show for you and some long days. And uh, congratulations on, on the launch of the new game. Thank you.